Hello there, friends. Andrew with the Bangs here and of the She Wonders Why podcast. On today's episode, I have Aaron Rabinowitz. I just need to note, I completely forget to introduce him until the very end of the actual interview. So I will remind you again, it's Aaron Rabinowitz, who I have on for this episode. He has been on my show before, and for this particular chat, we talk about the election. Although I do need to preface, we start off by chatting a little bit about his background and what he's doing right now, what he's studying. He's a professor of moral philosophy, but he is going for his PhD right now, so he is teaching and in class. So we discuss some of the classes are critical theory classes, and that gets us talking about critical theory. So that's the first half hour. And then we go into talk about the election and some concerns he has. Now, I do need to note, I like having a variety of perspectives on this podcast. In this particular interview, we discuss things from Aaron's perspective, which is quite a bit more left-leaning than, than I am, and then probably I'm guessing most of my audience, maybe not, but I do like to explore where I don't necessarily go personally, and I like to make sure I'm not missing something from a different perspective. I will have on someone who is coming from the more conservative side, so I like to make it, you know, multifaceted. But if you guys could watch with an open mind, I would love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear your comments or questions, as always. And I hope you enjoyed this discussion. And as usual, please do not forget to subscribe. Okay, we've officially started. So I was just asking you about your PhD. Yeah, so it's a PhD in education with a focus in moral education. So my background up to this point is in analytic, ethical philosophy. And I would like to figure out how to get better at teaching people both ethics and how to be better people. Um, and so... I don't actually have a PhD at this point. I just have the terminal master's mm -hmm. um, from Colorado State. So I uh, applied to the PhD at the, the university that I teach at and um, have started taking classes this semester. And it's been really great. Um, it's fun to be a student again after uh, just being a teacher for all those years. Get, get, um, get some empathy a, yeah. for your students. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was I was always one of the more empathetic, oh, okay. I think, probably teachers for my students in terms of, like, my my philosophical dispositions put me towards that direction already. Um, but, I, you know, certainly, especially this semester when everybody's dealing with the COVID situation as well, it's been quite a weird experience to be on both sides of that at the crisis at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, like being a teacher who's not coping while also being a student who's not coping and then like watching other teachers and students not coping is like <laughs> a fascinating multi-level experience mm. um you know but like also well it's a little bit because it's weird because i'm going from philosophy department to education department oh so it's searching and... oh yeah so there's different there's some differences in terms of like norms and expectations in terms of writing and stuff like that that like I'm still trying to to learn and figure out and like it's a bit weird a lot of folks I think come to education from sort of other departments or other backgrounds as well as from like a wide range of education backgrounds and so like there's a lot of I think diversity of approaches that people have for dealing with all of this stuff and so it's been a process of like trying to figure out what I have to do to adapt my analytic philosophy training to um, these classes, many of which, by the way, are in, are, are effectively all three classes that I took this semester were like the like hit list of like genres that when you think of like the culture war critical theory stuff. So it was like race theory, gender theory, you know, Marxist theories, Foucault, like all of the, the, the bad, <laughs> right? from one, from one that's, that's what I was going to ask. Um, what, 
what are they having you read? So that's it. That's what they're having you read. Yeah, well, so I'm taking three classes. One of them is the the pro sem, um, which is like all PhD students take this class. Um, and what that class has been was basically um, starting with like early educational analysis folks like Durkheim who are like arguing that like the purpose of education is to pump out good functional labor yeah, citizens right yeah the, the dawn right. of the factory system and right the, the, the factory yeah, model yeah. right and we've looked at like Du Bois's critique of that and and so we like worked through from from that sort of non-critical view up through the levels of like Marxist critical approaches that were like, you know, uh, just the straight Marxism. We read some, we read some Marx and then we read like, uh, folks like, um, let's see if I remember all the names now at this point, like Bordeaux, uh, Bordeaux and Willis and uh, a bunch of these sort of straight sort of class critical theorists talking about like how education actually just reproduces inequality instead of trans, trans uh, transforming uh, inequality into greater equality the way that like we as modern liberals like to hope that it would or could at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and so like we read through all of their critiques and then from them we jumped to like um, stuff like Foucault and, but also stuff like critical race theory, all of which I think is, and, and like, um, you know, black Marxism or, uh, racial capitalism, stuff like that. Um, all of which I think is taking those, those theories and developing them by adding sort of additional concerns that were being sort of under addressed within those analysis. So, you know, like it's been a really enjoyable history of, all of these different kinds of theories. Hey, well, I was going to say, like, this is your chance to to say why you don't think they're evil. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't, I don't think they're evil. I just like, I think that's the silliest thing I've ever heard because, mm -hmm. like, it to me, it, it's the exact same as if somebody came along and, like, they used to say this, right? Like, David Hume is evil, right? Did because they? He, he raised doubts about. Oh yeah, for sure. Because he was an atheist, yeah. oh, <laughs> like right. he raised doubts about miracles and things. How but, like, dare also he? Because <laughs> right, how dare he? Or like you know, he also raised doubts about induction and stuff. So like, to me, this stuff is is not different from skepticism. So I know some folks online like to say critical theory is different from critical thinking. I don't think they are <laughs> like I think critical theory is just a subset of critical thinking with a heavy emphasis on power and power relations and power dynamics and things like that, which is a very valuable form of skepticism that people have been doing for literally thousands of years and like should continue to do. And we just have new language for doing it. And like, you know, you can get into the details of like which papers are better and worse. But the majority of the stuff that I've read this semester has been quite like useful to me some of it is jargony mm -hmm. some of it i was just like this doesn't do anything for mm -hmm. me but like percentage wise compared to my experiences in analytic philosophy it's been still more good than bad i would say and so the other two classes that i'm taking one of them is, is a class called um education and society which is effectively sort of like the pro sem class for students in the master's program rather than the PhD program, which I didn't necessarily know going into it, but it's been, it's actually been really good because it's been different readings on the same topics as the pro sem essentially. So it's been like t taking the same class twice with like two different teachers and two different reading mm -hmm. lists. So I've just gotten a lot of really good in-depth. So like where one class would give a summary, another one gave me, you know, a first, um, like a primary text reading mm -hmm. from that particular source. Um, and then the other class I took was gender and ed, which again was a bunch of critical theory, you know, um, feminist theory, a lot of non-Western feminism, which has been really fascinating, getting mm, sort of mm -hmm. seeing the arguments within feminism between, you know, quote unquote, Western white feminism and non-Western, um, you know, people of color feminism generally. Oh, I would actually really like to know about that, but uh, I digress. Okay. But I actually do, I have to just say what I'm thinking about it because... 
this, this is a conversation and I'll give my opinion. I don't always give my opinion in these, but, but I, I, I do think I, I see where you're coming from. And like, I did that, um, letter conversation with Liam, as you know. And so I definitely have moved my understanding of critical theory um, but I do just think that it's not a place I want to live all the time being in critical theory. That's all. Like, like, that's the main takeaway for me from that is it's not that I am going to go around saying it's bad because I think looking at something from a perspective that you've literally never thought of. And honestly, like, I was like, this is dumb at first. Not when, not in my di- discussion with mm-hmm. Liam. Sorry, <laughs> like when I first heard about it, I was like, "This is dumb." Mm-hmm. But but you know when as I was you know going back and forth with Liam and then discussing with him later, it's like okay, I I if I'm more charitable in my reading, and if I look at the motivation behind the things that I might not understand a hundred percent because Aaron, I tried reading it reading the mm-hmm. stuff he sent me it was hard <laughs> it, it is hard some of it is hard <laughs> it is jargony and it was hard to read it but i did i i i can see why it is helpful to understand where people are coming from and to not be defensive right away but like but you don't want to live in a place of defensiveness all the time both sides i'm like who am i even talking to both of them (laughs) you don't want to be defensive all the time but but i think what i meant is like you don't want to be in a space of being critiquing everything all the time that's all yeah i mean so like one of my favorite all-time onion articles is an onion article that was like a feminist woman wants to turn off her brain for half an hour so that she can watch television and not feel bad about it. Like, (laughs) and I, I, I'm, I'm 100% sympathetic to this as an ethicist, there's a demandingness to ethics, broadly speaking. And like, nobody wants to live in that space all the time. And we have to figure out, I think how to balance that. And I think critical theory and all of these sort of critical race theory, all this stuff, right. Uh, critical studies, we'll call just this entire cluster of things, right. Has a demandingness to it because one of the key parts of it is that it does expect action. It does expect you to work towards change and mm-hmm. progress and mm-hmm. improvement. And I think that's an important part of it, but I do think it has to come, it has to be balanced. And mm-hmm. I think there are people who struggle with balance. And of course, if you spend a lot of time on the internet, you will in- interact with a lot of people who struggle a lot with these ideas mm-hmm. of balance. And like, not to malign them, it is very hard to figure out the right balance when you were talking about issues of people's basic rights and well-being and freedom and such like that. So, like, it's understandable why these are charged topics and it's understandable. I think it's totally understandable to have the perspective of I don't want to be in that space all the time. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, as a philosopher, I've come to accept that not everyone wants to be doing philosophy all the time. And if you like try to bug people with philosophy all the time, they will they will try to make you drink hemlock. So, (laughs) Like, yeah, no, I think that's okay. Like, I think it's okay to have other projects of worth in your life that aren't doing critical theory all the time, for example. Like, I think that's fine. And I think that, you know. We need to be able to separate that healthy lifestyle concern from like these views that these theories are evil and malignant and like undermining the very fabric of Western society, which is is a view that has not decreased in in, you know, the past few weeks, despite uh, you know, any events that might have occurred over the course of that time, um, yeah. nor do I expect it to do so at any point in the near future. Okay, well, because that's actually a good job bringing us to the real reason mm. I wanted to discuss this with you. Because, okay, so we did a letter conversation. Thanks for getting that last one in, by the way, before. Mm-hmm. Good for you, man. Oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> like, and you're, I just want to say, your and Liam's letter conversation is excellent, and everyone should read it. And, like, there specifically is a part in Liam's letter about critical toe stubbing theory that I think is an essential like corrective for for disambiguating 
is this a good theory versus is this theory being functionally applied in useful ways in practice? Mm -hmm. And I think those are two important and separate questions that often get run together in people's criticisms. Mm -hmm. And I, yes, and I actually was annoyed with them. They mm -hmm. the letter people sorry the letter people changed the name of my of the letter conversation. Did and they? I was, yeah, and I was like. That's not what I titled it. So I thought, this is not at all to your point. Like, this is just my own little, why'd uh -huh, you change it? Like, whatever. I think they changed it to <laughs> an introduction to critical race theory or something like that. And I, I called it on critical race theory, what are centrists missing? Which I thought was a little bit more accurate because I'm like, this is the group of people yeah. who are upset about it and so so yeah. so i'm like liam you're reasonable what are we missing <laughs> but whatever like whatever the title just, just the right amount of clickbaity i would say too so yeah like so like okay but i but i i don't like it because it makes me look like i'm like can i get a little intro please uh -huh, and then uh -huh. it's also not great for liam because liam's like this isn't i'm not i didn't i'm i don't i'm not even a professor in it I just, and I'm very sympathetic you know? to him about that, too. I actually would say, like, I think a lot of us who aren't critical theorists have been sucked into this weird world of, like, having to defend critical studies, like, without, like, even being experts in it. But, like, you understand the jargon because... better than the laity will say, even. Right. And the critiques of it are so bad, just like so unbelievably straw manny, right? Like so ridiculously over the top. Who's good? Evil, who's good though? Mustache twirl. Okay, well, who's good? Who's, who's a good, who's good good critique of critical race theory? I mean, there, are a, bunch of, there theory. are a bunch of good critiques within critical theory of itself that I think are worth reading. Okay. So like. You know, reading, uh, you know, feminists critiquing other feminists is very valuable, I think. Okay. Um, uh, one of my favorite readings this semester was uh, by a non-Western feminist named Mohanty. Uh, and the, the paper is titled, I think, Under Western Eyes. Um, and it's a really good critique of the way that, like, white Western feminism um, tends to, to produce the image of women in uh, developing countries as this kind of monolith of oppressed, marginalized, deficient women, women who have, you know, lack of access to education and lack of access to, um, you know, reproductive choice as a result of being all oppressed by fundamentalist religions or something like that, mm -hmm. for example, right, that it creates this image. And it does so because out of, you know, like it's trying to do the right thing in the sense of like trying to create a motivation for us to bring about change and help these women in these situations. But in doing so, it sort of ends up harming these women by, you know, making giving the impression that they all need one thing, which is like for white Western men to come in and save them from men, you know, like from religious men of color and liberate them so that they can throw off their oppressive clothing and be sexually liberated and such like that. Right. Okay. So you see, cause I kind of how, like so, subscribe to that. So mm -hmm. shoot. Yeah. That's the concern, <laughs> right? Is that a lot of, well-meaning moderate western liberal individuals and like here's the here's like i don't want to as i'm sure that some of your listeners are like well but there are a bunch of but problems in a bunch of these countries there and really yes are. there absolutely are a bunch of problems in a bunch of these countries and that's why it's complicated right yeah. so this is where i'm going to start just repeating over and over again that like the reality is these issues are much more complicated than the people who've been talking about them on twitter tend to make them out to be right so it's not a, a war between, you know, the people who think that there is objective truth and we can easily gain access to it in the war and the people who think like there's no objective truth ever that we can gain any knowledge about with regard to things like morality. It's a much more complicated situation okay. where like what she wants to say is different people are experiencing harmful results in different kinds of ways, but also some people don't see certain experiences as being harmful in certain situations. And we need to be careful that we are 
not just imposing our particular preferences on other people, which is a very like this is something in and this is why I come back to saying this stuff is just no different from the philosophy that I've been doing for the first half of my life, which is like ethics has all of these problems about cultural relativism. And there's a long history about trying to create objective ethical claims that allow us to justify interceding when women are being oppressed in in marginalized groups in certain areas including in theory in our own countries right and like there's always pushback against these things and there's always complexity to how you you know uh, figure out what the problem is and then address it in a way that respects the preferences of everybody involved as much as you can up to a point and then there are costs so like anybody who's selling you anything less complex than that is i think just missing a key part of the puzzle and so like i think this stuff just like ethics in analytic philosophy is highlighting key parts of the puzzle what we do with that is you know can go all sorts of different directions mm. but like the information like if we're really into this let's all be high decouplers or whatever they want to call it where you you know separate the theory from the practice right we should be higher decouplers about critical theory because the theory is valuable in a lot of ways and the practice is a mixed bag because human beings are a mixed bag. okay because yeah being reductionistic is not necessarily the mo the thing that will help and okay i will I'll con okay, I'll concede I'll concede in this way. It, it it it's something that even if we see a, even if we can see the problem like with regards to w w women's rights. Even if we could maybe agree mm -hmm. on the things that we don't like that is um say even though, like I I know this isn't really wasn't what you were saying but I'm I'm just going to do a unifying thing. So so even if we agree with like okay, yeah, that's not they should be allowed to um, and not shamed for, you know, taking off their niqab or whatever or hijab or whichever it is that they're wearing. Um, mm -hmm. And but but coming in and being like, so here's how you should figure this out. That's maybe where the problem there's a thing like we can't come in saying that like how often have we come in by we i mean the americans come in mm -hmm. and have been like yep, hey that's us. here here's well i mean i am canadian so i have to remember that sometimes no no you're right but yeah, no, but <laughs> but oh actually we're gonna switch you out for this regime oh it didn't go well Mm. right like you know like it, it's it's like that's the that's sort of the lesson that is a tough one for us to learn that that even if we can agree on the problem which we can't but even if we can our solutions aren't necessarily um something we can pick up put down and everyone's happy with it because it's a cultural context you have to understand the the different cultural contexts and mm -hmm. um and uh, the the answers our answers don't fit with a lot of people's um, but I do that said, I do want freedom for everyone. I, I understand it's complicated for me. I do not like modesty, enforced modesty clothing. Right. I do not like it when it is gender. I do not like it when it's non-gendered, but I especially don't like it when it's gendered. And I don't care whether we're talking burqas or uh, Hasidic Jewish requirements right. of like, you know, women shaving, shaving their heads and then wearing, um, um wigs i didn't know they um, were required so like, to I'm, do that that i mean i, I don't know if someone's going to argue with me about the word required but like that is the custom in certain hasidic as as, as their version of covering their head in modesty oh, okay. rather than wearing a hat they cover their hair by shaving or by, by keeping their hair very short and then wearing um, wigs. Oh. This is a very common thing in, in Hasidic um, Jewish culture, some parts of Hasidic Jewish culture. So, um, you know, I have a lot of personal problems with that. I have a lot of moral problems with it. I don't think it has any, like I don't think it would have any place in the utopia that I would construct. Um, how we get to my utopia from like the current world that we live in, if possible, I don't know. And like, I don't know how to do it in a way that isn't harmful to a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I care less about preserving sort of cultural tradition for cultural tradition's sake. But like, 
I acknowledge that there are that it would that it would cause a, a massive amount of suffering to try to try anything that would involve forcibly separating these people from their culture. Mm -hmm. And so the alternative of a passive process, you know, is much slower and probably doesn't actually ever get rid of the situation or it just transforms it into different cool. situations. Cool, no over solutions. Time. No solutions but then. <laughs> no solutions. And like an, there's an additional level of problem here too, which is it's not just is you know, how do we intercede with this clearly objectively bad thing? I think that's the case in certain situations. Like um, you know, there's there's there's, there's even debates about like burkas. But like I think I think a burqa is pretty it's a pretty clear cut problematic, um, you know, cultural artifact. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, stuff like folks like Mohanty will point out that we got to be careful and not slip into saying things like a hijab is by nature, um, you know, reduces people's autonomy or something like that or is by nature a reflection of oppression because she points out, for example, at various points in human history it has meant different things and when it was when it meant different things sometimes it meant quite the opposite so i think she points to iran where at two different points in iranian history right there's one period in which the enforcement of the wearing of hijabs was clearly indicative of a return to a kind of oppressive um patriarchal culture whereas at a different point it was done by women who had degrees of sort of autonomy and so enough social capital and as, as a kind of protest that was meant to empower women. So oh, yeah. And symbols have, we, yeah. we make the meaning of the symbol. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the ma masks can, that's something that like, you know, what did it mean at the beginning of COVID and what does it mean now? And, um, and, and whatnot. So yeah, I, I definitely understand the idea of like, it depends on who's seeing it and what it means to to them, basically. But okay, I'm gonna. I man, I'm mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's just like oh, like these are no. I know. I keep things. distracting you from. No, the but topic, I no, no no. It's like we can we can do the Rogan style where we're like we're just having a conversation. You know, like it's not. It's yeah. it's it's fine. I will never like to. I'm not going to be associated. Oh, with I'm, so style, I'm so, so sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you're, I should have known you're not like he's not your favorite, but but okay, it's yeah. like I I just am happy to talk about topics that are interesting, um especially when I have someone sure. like you with your um different perspectives. Okay, <laughs> wow, Andrea, I'm especially with someone <laughs> like you with your different perspectives, way to make it's your okay. guest feel it's like okay. really comfortable. <laughs> okay. It's all right, I could do my Alex Jones. Thing <laughs> About how it's the demons coming oh through your gosh, vitalizes. Okay, we could do that if you like. Okay, okay. <laughs> Look, if you want the Rogan experience. <laughs> the, right? the oh gosh, oh bad timing. Okay, the up. the if he hadn't just had him on, I think it would have made more sense. But now it's like that's not what I meant. No. I swear. Okay, so so the election did it go? I'm yeah. gonna guess that it went how you liked. <laughs> went great. What election? Which election? Uh, okay, because <laughs> honestly, for me, it's kind of okay. Even apart from anything happening that is like to do with me, I'm in Canada. It's like, oh, it's it's all over, yay! So it's kind of just not, over no, for it's me. Not all over. I know, but like for it's like there were there were no riots. The people with the guns did not come for the people without the guns. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> yet oh, okay you need to put the word yet it feels at the end like of it's every over one of me, your but you're saying it's not over okay so what 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 do you mean yet okay they're not gonna they're not coming i hope well look here's the problem with you with this situation right in my in my opinion right there is a substantial risk of vigilante violence of some sort whether it will actually happen or not i don't multiple plots that have been foiled already by the police and the fbi so like and like america has a substantial history of violent right militia groups anti-government groups and they have been stirred up in the worst possible way by everybody from donald trump to alex jones so like i don't feel at all confident that there is zero violence in our future like the, the election isn't over yet when when trump is removed from office if he is removed from office which i think is likely right then we see 
what happens to the energy that has been stoked by these people for years. And maybe it okay. will just go underground again. Maybe they won't attempt another Oklahoma City or something like that. I don't know, but it's terrifying. Like, like the Department of Homeland Security in America rates violent white supremacists as the number one threat to the country right now. So like people who have a good handle on this stuff are not ignoring this. They do not think that it is a small problem. And like the people who are getting away right now with saying, oh, there's not going to be any violence. There's not going to be any violence. I'll be really curious to see what they say if it happens to be the case that as, as I think is possible, if not likely, that there is some sort of violence. So that's why I think it is really important to say yet at the end of the types okay. of claims. And there has already okay, been well... some street violence, right? It just hasn't escalated to the level right. that we're talking about yet. Okay, and I I am hopeful that it won't mm -hmm. be then, I guess. But I'm also hopeful that it will. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I imagine, so I'll give you that chance to, to yeah, uh, c to concur with me. You're like, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm yeah. not wanting to be proved right here, people. I mean, that, that's why it's a shitty situation, right? If you're right, then I, like we should all be happy and we don't actually have more violence, right? And I don't get to have any happiness if I end up being right, because then there's violence. But like, I also think it's really important not to downplay the severity of the rhetoric that is being being used right now to motivate, you know, what is the lowest energy coup I've ever seen, right? It's just the laziest, like, slackerist coup ever. But it is still an attempt at subverting a democratic process in a substantial kind of way. And, and that's why I say the election isn't over is because they're still actively subverting the democratic process, right? There's no indication so far from Mitch McConnell or anybody that they are at this point willing to bite the bullet and tell Trump he's lost. And as long as they continue to enable him in this way, we're all in a lot of danger. Okay. And then even when they stop enabling him, we're all in a lot of danger until he's removed from office in January. Okay. Okay, so it's not over. Okay, so that's covered. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, to to the point of our, our letter we had about the moral obligation to vote. Do you think mm -hmm. that, because you did bring up the every vote counts idea when I dismissed it so unfeelingly <laughs> so i am glad i'm glad that you brought it up because i oh, i've i've heard i've just heard sometimes you know it just doesn't matter especially in your in certain mm -hmm. counties but mm -hmm. you brought up the um that one election where one vote literally did count so do you think that every vote counted in this case in this election i mean what do you what do you think i think it your... kind of did because it was so close. I think it kind of did, right? Well, like, look, Georgia is blue and North Carolina is red. That may not mean much to you as a north of the borderite, but like, there are there are probably uh, like less than ten percent of all of the predictions, all the maps that people put forward for how the election would go, would have told you that North Carolina. A state – and like, here's how you can understand American politics, right? The further south you get, the redder you get, mm -hmm. OK? Right? So literally democracy drips down from the north to the south. It's, it's a horrible joke about our history. Oh, um, gosh. But okay. like – but like – but you can see it literally in the way that like the blue has shifted down into Virginia from D.C. Mm -hmm. and is like shifting from Virginia down into North Carolina, which is right below Virginia. And so people thought that's why a lot of people thought, you know, like that that's a simple way of putting it. But like North Carolina has been sliding blue in various ways okay. and was like considered to be more likely to flip than Georgia, which is farther yeah, yeah, down yeah, in the down south, there, yeah. right, is, is, is Georgia, right, the the place of, of uh, you know, famous Confederate events different from Virginia. Yeah, uh, yeah. But like, you know, it's very, it was very unlikely. And so, you know, to, if you had lived in Georgia, right, you might have said to yourself, well, I live in Georgia, right, there's no chance that my vote counts. It's a safe red state. It's not North Carolina. And you'd have been wrong, mm -hmm. right? You'd have just been straight up flat wrong about that. Um, now, we didn't flip Texas, for example, but, you know, we certainly made some progress in, in Texas. And and then, like, here's the, the reality is, like, every vote does count because 
I don't even feel like we totally won the election in the the important sense, right? I think everybody looks at Biden beating Trump and thinks Democrats won the election. And the reality, I think, unfortunately, is we removed a fairly incompetent autocrat from power, which is good, hopefully, right? Assuming he actually gets removed from office, which I do think will eventually happen, right? But we didn't flip the Senate, most likely. And if we don't win the the runoffs in Georgia, we're unlikely to flip the Senate, um, which means that there's not going to be any substantial governance right. for at least the next two years, because Mitch McConnell is just going to continue to shut everything down. Um, we didn't flip a bunch of the state houses that we needed to flip for the sake of doing redistricting in a way that isn't horribly gerrymandered to support the Republicans. So expect another 10 years worth of gerrymandered House seats, making it so that Democrats can't win majorities even when they win vastly more votes. So like, uh, you know, I think Ezra Klein over at Vox, not, not anymore, but formerly over at Vox pointed out that like, you know, democracy lost in this election. Like we didn't, we didn't win on the structural issues that we needed to win on so that we could then make further structural changes to counteract the entrenched systemic minority rule that the Republicans have established for themselves. And so honestly, I think we're still kind of screwed. <laughs> well, <laughs> I know you want optimism. I haven't. I have no, well, OK, well, that's OK. That's OK. Well, it's the thing is, it's it's. Democracy lost in to me in the way that it's so polarized the entire country, whether or not you're a Democrat or a Republican, you're you're seeing the other side as the enemy. And that's your countrymen. Yeah, I mean, a polarization is absolutely part of the problem. And again, I'll, I'll crib. I was reclining again, who just wrote a book about polarization, that like we are in an extremely polarized position. And that's why, for example, I'm not keen to hear people be like, oh, you overreacted about the risk of violence, because like the polarization is not going away. And when people who are that polarized feel like they've really lost all control of levers of power, there's likely to be responses, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but like, yeah, we are highly polarized. Part of the problem, though, is everybody looks at polarization in our system, which is a dualist system because we have these two parties, and assumes the polarization is in some way equivalent and like, equally problematic on both sides and equally justified on both sides. And I think that kind of both siderism is fueling a death spiral for our democracy because it's allowing an incredibly far more radicalized and harmful far right wing to dominate the discourse and like is, is leading to them being able to, you know, get away with effectively undermining, um, you know, voter access and things like that with zero consequences, effectively packing the Supreme Court with zero consequences. And like those systemic problems are to me more worrying than the polarization, because I think the polarization is at least, if anything, an accurate acknowledgement that we have very different morals in this country and that like that's that's just a reality that needs to be addressed. I think there are different groups in this country that have different perspectives on issues like race and equity and such like that. And, you know, polarization to me is us getting that out in the open rather than hiding it. And that seems like a good thing. And if we had a functioning democracy, we could then fight it out democratically and like people would make policy and then we'd see who liked which policy more and then we'd move from mm -hmm. there. But we don't have that. We have a system where the Republicans are positively reinforced for preventing any legislation from happening. Like they've had no legislative agenda for the past four years short of a tax cut. And there's no And why is that significant? Like, goal. Oh, sorry, there's no goal? Well, because they don't have to. Like, like in a functioning democracy, if you sit in government and don't do anything, you get voted out and replaced by somebody who does something, right? In our government, the Republicans are being rewarded for sitting in government and doing nothing, which means nothing gets done, which means no progress on climate change, no infrastructure week, right? The great perennial joke of the internet, right? No, you know, uh, addressing of... Um, 
policing or criminal justice reform, like substantial criminal justice reform. There was a bill that was passed during the Trump administration. It made some improvements, but not many. Um, but like there's no attempt to really marshal government as a means to improve people's lives because since the 80s since Reagan the motto the, the motto of the GOP has been government is the problem not the solution oh man I have some libertarian leanings because I kind of don't have much faith in the system anyway like that's one of the things that came out in my letter with you the letters with you because I and it sounds like you don't have faith in the system too, like a little. So I would say I am skeptical of the system, but I'm vastly more skeptical of the alternatives, especially any of the ones that libertarians are bringing to the table with all due respect to my libertarian friends. <laughs> like I don't see an alternative to the state. And I think you either have a functioning state or a dysfunctioning state. And I think under the guise of appeal to libertarianism, what you actually have gotten from the GOP is a corporate cronyism state whose entire function is to siphon as much wealth into as few pockets as possible. And like it's worked. They the like the wealth inequality gap is grown exponentially in my lifetime because and you can directly tie it to Republican policies during their control, you know, during their administrations. But the thing is, if we got rid of the Republicans, it's not I don't think that like, oh, and then the the savior Democrats will be good and distribute everything properly. Like I, they would become corrupt, too, because they'd be like the monarchs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't I don't buy the idea that in principle, all governments are necessarily corrupt and will always tend towards corruption. I think there are functioning developed countries that have you know like systems that do redistribute redistribute wealth in a way that does tend to benefit people everyone to some extent are they perfect systems absolutely not but like they could be far better than the current system we have i don't think we're going to get rid of the republicans because of the way that the the american system works it doesn't allow i know just hypothetically I know. yeah no i mean like and like i also don't know like you know i'm i'm not optimistic because i think we're stuck with a cult that is increasingly isolated and increasingly radicalizing and i don't know how we address that when it's a cult that is made up of 20 to 30 million people living across an entire country and i don't of the country is it right like oh well i guess it depends on what you're meaning i was thinking about like i mean i think there's a lot of unaffiliated like i mean like the people who are significantly caught within the sort of gop ecosphere mm -hmm. um which i think yeah is I, mean, I don't know how many people it is. It's a lot more than like any cult that, you know, people have successfully dealt with in the past. Um, and it's it's very dangerous. And it's going to, you know, I don't. Why think is it dangerous, though? Trump wasn't telling me. Well, I mean, do you care about climate change? Yes. OK, they don't believe it exists. <sighs> or they don't believe it's caused by humans. Or they don't believe it's worth addressing in any way that would cause any sort of economic. Cost. Okay, well, I. All of those things. I think that people like their cushy lifestyles, everybody, everybody across the board. And that, uh -huh. uh, and I do think that, yes, there should be innovations that could make, you know, like the electric car situation, I think would be great to uh, just across the board, you know, make it available for re regular people. Um, but I think that people don't care about changing enough in all, everybody though, not all, like, you know, like we use our iPhones with mine our the, the, whatever little thing, whatever stuff that gets mined from terrible, like Let's child. Go. Okay. Yes. The thing that, you know, what, the thing that I'm not articulating very well, that, that yeah anyway it it people getting are like they're not like boycotting their iPhones I mean some are but I also think this is sort of like the you know oh you think society needs to change yet you participate in society cartoon is it, yes like, I'm being a cartoon right now then I I, I let me I just you know 
it cl- we clearly need to try to improve things. Like, to, I don't understand this idea that society, like, people are resisting the idea that, like, the function of society is to improve people's, like, it's, it, and it's also weird because to me it's the same people who think that the birth of the modern state in the Enlightenment period brought about the greatest improvement in human quality of life in all of human history, which I'm sympathetic to. Like, I'm sympathetic to, like, this liberal idea that, having these functioning liberal democracies is as close as humans have gotten to to, to a good way to live mm-hmm. right in human history like I'm, I'm i'm not opposed to that and then it's so weird because then i say and then we should go one step further and like try to address race and radical wealth inequality and like all of these other things and then all of a sudden it's like oh but but now we're libertarians we want to stop all of that state related progress that we've been accomplishing for these hundreds of years right. because we're afraid of government overreach. And okay. like I, I get the fear of government overreach, but I I think that we can do better. I think we can easily do better. Um, and I think the reason we are failing to do better is because there are incredibly wealthy moneyed interests that like make that uh, near impossible in our current system. Like whatever happened to, you know, oh, pollution is bad. That was just so simple. It was just a simple message. Just uh, let's let's reduce pollution. Uh, well, we still have that. I I know I know, <laughs> but like it now it's now it's it's not. I, I don't think that Republicans would be like, no pollution's good, you know, like that that can we not unite over pollution is just not great and let's reduce emissions. I don't know what at this point would convince the Republicans to actually take climate change seriously because nothing has worked, right? Like you're asking for a cure to a disease that is just running rampant with with no idea about how to treat it. I know, I'm just like, trying to think of like, what can we unite on? It's okay, so- Well, so like, here's, here's something I'll say. I think that we need to be careful and not imagine that there is a magic spell or silver bullet that cures the problem of people believing wrong things persistently. Okay, you're right. Fine. Okay, we'll move on then because we're not going to solve it on this in this podcast. So, okay, so what what do you think of the um? I I I've I've I haven't I don't want to say that I've read it because because that's not true. But I've I've heard a couple talks by Jonathan Haidt about like the political spectrum and how it's both sides are needed, both the tradition side and both the uh, liberal side. Like the sort of like we need to, both are needed in society. We can't jettison either because they're both, they both have their function. So what do you, what do you think of that? Yeah. So I, I do teach Heights, um, righteous mind or, or, you know, excerpts from his moral foundations theory material okay. in my ethics class. Um, so I, I will say I think some of the work that Haidt has done is valuable and other parts of it are very not valuable okay. <laughs> or like are, are problematic in a variety of ways. I think when he does descriptive uh, psychology where he where he just tries to figure out what do people believe and like what are they basing those beliefs on rather than what they should believe. Right. When he just does the is rather than the ought. Like he produces some interesting work. Now, there are some critiques of his work being not universalizable beyond limited cultural domains in which he's done the research so far. I'm not sure on that as to how that has played out so far. But I do think, you know, his discussion of moral foundations. So the the basic idea for folks who are not familiar is human beings have this cluster of found moral foundations on which they base their ethical judgments, things like, you know, reducing harm and can and increasing care, things like respecting autonomy, things like justice and fairness. Mm-hmm. Right. And these, this, these concepts are often in tension, right? So we often see in ethics situations where you have to make a trade off between autonomy and fairness, for example. Um, mm-hmm. And what he would say is, what you see in the range of different societies is different people 
or different communities making different decisions about those trade-offs. Some communities value the sacred more than the harmful, or for example. And so what you get as a result of that is societies that engage in, uh, you know, self-mutilating behaviors for religious purposes. Right. Just to just to give an example of how this plot this stuff plays out. Um, and I think that's that's plausible to me as an as an ethicist. I am a moral foundations theorist in the sense that I believe that there are a range of objective, uh, defeasible ethical truths, much like what he's describing, that are real and that we have an obligation to act based on. So like my meta ethics correlates pretty closely in various ways to his descriptive moral psychology. So I am I am sympathetic to it in those ways. Now, here comes the but, right? Here's the turn. Um, when he starts to talk about what we ought to do about morality based on his theory, I think he tips his hand to being overly sympathetic towards conservatism in ways that are um, not particularly insightful. Um, so he, in the original book, Righteous Minds, argues that liberal he, he describes um our ethical the, the, this framework as a, like a like a palette like your taste buds on your tongue mm -hmm. right and so you have like all these different taste buds and what he says is the the taste buds for liberals are defective <laughs> because what we find consistently is it's you know as, as far as i know with the research liberals tend to prioritize two categories above all else uh, fairness or justice and reducing harm, mm -hmm. okay, slash increasing care. And they prioritize those above things like authority, purity, you know, yeah. uh, loyalty, stuff like that. It's the right? masculine the and the feminine. That's that's kind of what it sounds like. Uh, okay, okay, that's too many things. Okay, don't, sorry, don't make me sorry. Too many things. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pack one thing at a okay. time and then we can unpack the feminist masculine okay. distinction if you want. Um, but like, so he says it's defective because conservatives weight all the things equally, essentially, roughly equally, whereas okay. liberals prioritize the two things over the other ones. And he says that's because they're undervaluing purity and, and all these other things and, and they the should value them more. Now, whatnot, the most okay. generous reading of his argument, right, the one that I think if we want to salvage his claims here is that when you are engaging with conservatives – you should talk in the language of all of these different foundations and not just justice and fairness. So there's a kind of code switching that if you can do it authentically, right? If you don't do it as like I'm placating you or I'm I'm, you know, patronizing right. using your language, right? That I think is um, valuable for persuasion. And that the whole point of his book is all about ethical persuasion. So like I am sympathetic to that. I don't actually think that liberals have a defective ethical palette. Quite the opposite. If I were to make the argument, I would say the conservative palette is the one that's defective. Surprise, and this is an surprise. argument that's made by well, this is an argument that's made by Joshua Green in Moral Tribes, which is another really good book, okay. where he basically pushes back on um on Height's analysis and says, well, what if, what if we put it this way? What if instead of seeing the liberal palette as defective, we actually see it as more refined? And I know that plays to every elitist liberal trope possible, <laughs> but the idea that he, what he mean, what he means is, look, what the liberals have actually figured out, and I 100% agree with him on this, is purity, authority, loyalty are not ends in themselves. They are a means to an end. They are very good tools in certain situations for achieving the things that are ends in themselves. What are the ends in themselves? Justice and reduced suffering and increased well-being for human beings. So what we can say about the liberal view is that it has recognized correctly that of the moral foundations that we have built into us by biology, by culture, by everything – Two of them are the actual true ends in themselves, and the other ones are, are very effective means to an end that certain cultures have mistaken as ends in themselves. And so that's why I would say okay, that's actually it's pretty, actually the opposite. Pretty good. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, <laughs> it's more it's more I'd it's it sort of ties it in and, and I'm sure there's a counter I mean, I'm sure Jonathan Haidt has opinions. Of that, I'm sure he does. Himself. But I, I, I can see, I can see the continuity, and um, it makes sense. Um, I always okay. I always kind of operate more on an, even though I, 
Like, I'm not really a libertarian. I like having the public health care that we have in Canada, even though we're going into crazy debt over it. Um, but it must be nice. <laughs> it, well, it is. My actually, my that, my son has diabetes, type one diabetes, and so it's like you know, I I go in every three months, and I don't have to worry about paying for. Let me um, things. yeah. Let me can I tell you a ten second story? Yes, please, but it's not really please. gonna be a ten second, but you know, um. So so because I'm in this PhD program, right? I can no longer teach as a PTL at my university. Okay. Um, which means that I no longer get to be on the health insurance that I've been on as a PTL yeah. for the past year, which means for the next semester in the spring, I'm going to have to switch to the student health insurance okay. and I'm going to have to put my wife on the student health insurance too. My wife is a, is a cancer survivor um, who for the past six years has been coping with the horrifying nature of our healthcare system by having to constantly move between, you know, healthcare providers to get her, you know, cancer screening, catch up, follow up stuff to make sure that she's not relapsing. Mm -hmm. Right. While I've been, you know, tr doing my best as a person, as an adjunct in the academic system to try to get a stable health insurance of some sort. So like we haven't even been able to secure her going to the same doctor consistently mm. for multiple years over the course of this only six year process of trying to keep her alive. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm going to have to switch her again to a different health insurance. And I don't know if it's going to continue to that if her current providers will continue to be on it. And then here's the kicker. When I get my TA ship in the fall through my GSE program, I will go back on the same full time employee health insurance oh that I'm gosh. on right you now, switch again. which means she, she will go back to the health insurance that she is on now. So for the first half of next year, she's going to be on a different health insurance. And then she's going to go back to the health insurance mm -hmm. that she's but like it's just an endless pain like it's it, like the amount of emotional and psychological harm that is caused simply by trying to navigate your way to the doctor before dealing with any of the medical stuff yeah. is awful. Yeah. And that's that's what the libertarians want is this privatized system. And and like can I, I can curse on here, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. OK. Fuck that. <laughs> Fuck that forever. Like, fuck anything that is moving away from government-sponsored, government-run health insurance at this point because private health insurance in this country has been – especially employee-connected private health insurance has been a human disaster for everyone I know for my entire life. And I would run screaming into the arms of socialized medicine if I could right now. Well, and – I I think the population has a huge part of it. We have one Canadian for every ten Americans. I, I, I I'm not saying that this is like so so therefore this, but I, I mm -hmm. there's a lot of barriers and and I do think that there's a lot of um the the the, cent, the centralized it, it's per um province. So I have I'm in Alberta. I have Alberta healthcare, and so the fact that we have yeah a, a more centralized space. Like for being in Alberta for me, you know, and if, if we're going to, if my husband and I were, um, he's in university right now, but when he graduates, like we've been talking about maybe, um, being open to looking for jobs in the States. And it's like, well, we, we have to have full health care if we move because of our son's di diabetes. So I, I definitely, um, sorry, not full health care, full benefits, I guess. Um, and, and yeah, so I definitely see the conundrum there and so that's why i'm like i'm not a full libertarian um i i can see why if the system screws you around you're like get rid of the system like i get it i get why that's a, something that like you just were like it's broken so like get away with it let's get it you know but but i i i very much um, and I've just talked about, this is why I brought up the feminine versus the masculine. Cause I think of the feminine as like the, the nurturing side and the masculine as the more, I don't want to say authoritarian side. Cause that just sounds like I'm like patriarchy, but like, I mean, is the, the, whatever, you know, the, 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 let's get this done side. Um, but, but like, I, I am on the side of like, I am not, I think that each individual person needs to nurture themselves to be better. And, and and needs to um you know be a little bit more not a little bit more to be like that stoic principle that Liam talks about in the letter exchange that we had 
uh, that that is like the the thing that um it's like you you're only responsible for yourself you can only control yourself and rather than blaming the world that's what you, you again uh, i know that there needs to be others because otherwise things will not change <laughs> i just i imagine he would be unhappy i think actually. oh no no so i don't i don't mean to say be like what i'm describing um I, know. I understand there need to be world changers um, so i'm not saying like don't attempt this sure but i'm saying for me when i feel very not powerful and like there's nothing that can be done it's like you know if the system does screw me over in this or that way or like you know if i feel like overwhelmed in that way i just kind of go back to that like oh i can't i can only control myself and then i feel better yeah, I mean, I, I deal with this, too, with the stress of the, the scheduling and the like the the constant bureaucratic nightmare. Like I do my mindfulness work. I try to do my acceptance work. I try to, you know, make peace with the reality that I am currently living in rather than the one that I would like to be living in. I I think all of that is good for keeping yourself sane. Right. And I'm not opposed to any of that. Um, I, I don't want us to ever allow it to slide us into thinking that this is okay that like any of this is remotely okay um because it's too easy it's too easy for the human mind to normalize hell in that kind of way and for us to slip into you know what nietzsche would call a neoplatonic kind of slave cult okay but um, you just said so... that we're not that this isn't the worst system you've seen worse as like like wait wait with regards to government no, i mean I, I mean my system oh i mean like it, so, you 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 said that I mean, a, a bit ago. Like, you're like, well, I mean, is it the system? It like the, the government, I guess, voting that we were talking about. You're like, it definitely works. There's other ones that don't. No, work. I mean, I think that I do think that we've made. But substantial now it's hell. Progress. Okay, that's what I'm like. Well, so I think we've made substantial progress, and there's still a lot of suffering. And so, so yeah. So let me actually. There's a fun thing that I bring up sometimes that I call the paradox of progress. Okay, okay, this sounds about that what I, I'm thinking. Okay, that I that I genuinely wrestle with myself, which is simultaneously feeling and being able to point to concrete examples of progress and say, "Look, we've made huge, substantial progress." You know, pull out my Steven Pinker mask and talk about you know decreases in violence and such like that, or and something child like mortality that. and right. an infant, sorry, infant mortality. Right, and it's, yeah, it's very easy for me to swap hats and be like, and here's all the ways in which we are still in a living hell and driving ourselves towards a worse, you know, worse living hell, like. You know, so both of those things feel true to me, mm -hmm. right? It's simultaneously true that we abolished slavery and that there are more human slaves in the world now than there were, were during the Civil War. So, mm -hmm. like, it, they're both true, and that's the paradox. Um, so, so to answer your question, right? Like, I do, I do still support the liberal progressive dream of state progress towards greater quality of life for everyone. I also acknowledge the ways in which it is failing profoundly to address climate change right now. And like the ways that that is externalizing a bunch of suffering on to a bunch of people who will become refugees and then will be treated as inferior because they are also refugees and people of color and such. Okay. <laughs> They're all, it's all like the reality is complicated. It's all like I can give you both sides of every I can give you the opposite side of the height argument I gave from earlier. Right. I can play both sides of all the boards. I don't it doesn't mean that I think that they're equally always correct and good. OK, but like you're not wrong that there are concerns to be had on all sides. Um, Man, being a philosopher, think... you must just like. There's so like, right, there's so many. Yeah, like there's a reason why. <laughs> On the good place, Chidi is a moral philosopher, <laughs> and yeah. he's and like the crippled phrases, with like why everybody hates. I can't them. make decisions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and why everybody says this is why everybody hates ethics professors. Yes. You're like this is why because you have all yeah, the sides that you're like. Well, you have your own personal like. You're like, yeah, I think this, but but you're like, but I can lay them all out. Okay, I do need to. Uh, okay, wait, wait. okay, sorry. You, yeah. you, you were saying. I, I have one last question for well, you. Well, I mean, I, that that to me is what philosophy is supposed to be able to do, right? And like, 
I, I think being a good philosopher is being being able to genuinely lay all those sides out and then come back from that armchair place and say, but it's still the case that the GOP is a death cult that is slowly spiraling our planet towards a climate change. Okay, abyss, okay. And that we need to like do every like, do you know what I mean? Like. I think it's so easy for people to think, oh, well, if you can see all of these different sides, then you should end up somewhere in the middle. And I don't think that's the correct answer every time. There are some times where you see all the sides and then go, and this one side is still much, much stronger and needs to be given priority in this particular argument. Okay. See, I'm so like, but wait, if we just all agree on nuclear... Like, I'm just, I, I can't help but think I'm of... I'm fine. I mean, like, I, I think that nuclear is something that the liberals need to be better about, to be honest. I think that, or leftists need to be better about, or whoever you want to point to as being, like, the people who are... Like, I think nuclear is an important transitional step. Um, and I, that's what I'm saying. Think... Maybe that's... I just can't help, like, my, my peacemaker mind is like, but wait, what if we just focus on this? So what I think would be valuable for radicalizing your peacemaker mind is to try to find out why the things that seem really obviously like easy low-hanging fruit aren't being plucked in our country okay. well i'm in canada though you know what i mean <laughs> i know i know but i mean if you're yeah. even if you're curious to understand why like america is slowly dragging everybody over a cliff like okay. find out why the GOP is resisting. No, I know it's follow the money. All, it's it's always where the money all, is. Yeah. It's following the money. So okay. Sure, money, money, and money and race. I would say money and okay. race. Okay. Okay. And, and well, and race eventually reduces maybe down to money, maybe. Okay. Or power. Right, like Foucault said, it's all power. power. It's all power, either in the form of money or race or both. Okay. <laughs> Man, I keep on trying to wrap up. <laughs> just, okay, okay but i do i do have to ask this because i i i do have i i okay so i have some trump supporter friends that i know i know would be like ask this so okay i i think i know your answer but like do you think that trump supporters are either evil or dumb i just need uh, to clear up some things i need to clear up the classic evil, the classic evil or stupid question. Yes, um, yes. This question goes way back. Actually, there's a brilliant um, people should look it up. It was a daily show sketch of evil or stupid with John Oliver before he went to his new show um, okay. talking about um, Fox News and like Fox News doing a bit about a Saudi prince being an evil supporter of terrorism and also ignoring the fact that that same Saudi prince is a funder of Fox News or something like that, right? Oh, okay. So it was like one of these examples of like, do they know or are they that dumb, right? So I don't want to call Trump supporters evil or stupid, right? I don't know if they like, if they'll prefer my alternative answer, but like I, when I call it a cult, I'm not kidding. I, I've studied occults quite a bit. I run an ironic cult for a living. Um, like I'm, I'm, oh man, I want to ask you about that, but I, yeah, okay. kind of say so that's, that's why you leave them wanting more. That's the important trick. Okay. Um, okay. no, I, I think that they are caught up in an informationally isolated, um, you know, white supremacist death cult. And, I have nothing but sympathy for people who get caught up in cults. Like it's the human mind is built for it. And it's so easy to get pulled into those places. And I think it's pure luck that distinguishes between you and me and someone who ends up in QAnon, for example. So I don't think they're evil. I don't, they're not necessarily dumb either. What they often find is that like people who get sucked into cults are often, educated they often i mean you know in the like by dumb we mean book smarts right which is a stupid way to talk about dumb but like um you know if we're talking about academic right academic people are just as susceptible to cults as anything else right see james Lindsay. um so like Man, we made it I, so far without bringing him up <laughs> i just had to slide that one <laughs> okay. in there. i mean it was such an important data point i felt like okay. um uh, if people wanted the facts about this sort of thing so like you know i'm answering your question i you know some of them are low empathy i think i think a reoccurring 
thing that you find is uh, a propensity for authoritarianism and against empathy. Um, but that's not universally true of everyone in these groups. Um, the ones that are low empathy, I think, you know, I wouldn't call them evil, but I would certainly say they hold immoral views and act in immoral ways. And I would want to oppose their immoral behavior. Um, and then other ones, you know, because it's an information isolating cult, I wouldn't call them dumb, but I would call them isolated from reality right from the actual objective facts about things like climate change um and so like those are the problems and like the real problem are the people who are keeping them in that cult because they need them for political and social power so why would you say that it is that way in one party but not the other Ah, you want to wrap up, but that's a history lessons worth of American history right there. So the, the short answer is the Southern strategy, right? The short and dirty answer is you, you, during the era of climate or none of us, sorry, during the era, era of civil rights legislation, okay. right? Um, when, you know, the Civil Rights Act gets passed, essentially, as this famous quote uh, by, by Johnson, I think, who signs it, right, that we've just lost the South for a generation. And he was wrong. We'd actually lost it for multiple generations, probably. So what he meant was there was a great realignment, since that's a popular phrase right now, uh, a great reset that happens in American culture where the Republican Party becomes the party of white people. And it becomes it quite actively. It deliberately courts the white majority vote at the expense of any attempts to um, to get uh, – people of color. And that strategy has continued to play out in through the present. And so as that group of white majority has whittled down in terms of being less and less of a majority, um, you see, you know, you see this uh, attempts to maintain minority control. Um, and you accomplish that through a variety of mechanisms and such. Um, but, but essentially what happens is what the difference is the Democratic Party does actually cater to a wide tent. And because it caters to a wide tent, it's generally a healthier party. It, it has it, it has legislative agenda for starters, right? Whereas the Republican Party's legislative agenda at this point is prevent, any more demographic shifts, prevent any more economic shifts that destabilize the situation for their white base. And, and like if you're if you're wondering if I'm overplaying this as a social justice warrior, can I can I read you a quote? Actually, Please. this is one of my favorite quotes, one of my favorite quotes in all of American history, okay. um, except I can't say some of the words in it because it's an American history. OK, quote. well, you can um, you can censor so it how you need to. Yeah. Right. So this is from Lee Atwater, who was a Republican strategist involved with folks like Nixon. And so he's um, asked about, um, you know, why is Reagan talking about food stamps and such? And here's what Atwater says. He says, y'all don't quote me on this, right? You start out in 1954 by saying N-word, 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 except not the N-word, right? By 1968, you can't say N-word. That hurts you. Backfires. So you say things like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. You're getting so abstract now that you're talking about cutting taxes. And all these things you're talking about are totally economic things. And a byproduct of them is that blacks get hurt worse than whites. And subconsciously, maybe, that is part of it. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that it is getting that abstract and that coded that we are uh, doing away with the racial problem one way or another, right? You follow me, because obviously sitting around saying uh, we want to cut this is much more abstract than even the busing thing and a hell of a lot more abstract than N-word, N-word, right? So what he's laying out here is the birth of the sort of dog whistle white movement as a mechanism for, you know, continuing racial segregation, racial control, white supremacy. But instead of saying, you know, the N-word over and over again, you're saying things like welfare queens or you're talking about Black Lives Matter or you're talking about riots or thugs or, you know, Antifa radicals or something like that. Oh, okay. Okay. So making it more and more... Um... Well, although the ones that you just described that are the current ones are starting to sound a little bit more directly what it was 
<laughs> but but you know, like with regards to like like black is in uh-huh. the Black Lives Matter. It's it's in there. But but the, the, look, sure, the, looking sure. at um say uh, the one that I know for sure that exists um funding for education or funding for schools depending on uh zones where 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 people live in in population uh-huh. or, or yeah. in in the city Lo- localized funding yeah. right as combined with red line yeah so so uh, that's a sort of more abstract way of like the it being oh well back when people were moving into these neighborhoods only white people were allowed to move into this zone and only black people were allowed to move into this zone. And as a result, and a generation or generations later, education mm-hmm. funding gets um, put into this space and that's, yeah. So I, I so it, it's perpetuated. I, I understand that. And that's sort of talking about, um, so that's getting more and more abstract though, because you have to go back to like see it, right? Is that sort right. of Right, and let's, yeah, no, exactly. And so then tying that to the Trump campaign, for example, right, Trump repeatedly said um, over the campaign, you know, when he was talking to suburban white women in particular, he would literally like call out suburban white women and then talk about how like he was going to protect them from having low income housing moving into their suburban neighborhoods and destroying their suburbs. Now, that's Trump being bad at dog whistling, right? He like really he doesn't obviously. do dog whistles. He just says the he just says the quiet part out loud, yeah. right? So like you really see it is that same southern strategy of protecting white people from people of color vaguely coded as, you know, economically uh low worse okay, off. Okay, okay, but I will say that there are people of color who are Trump supporters and who do vote for Trump would have voted voted for Trump, right? So sure. and I don't know the percentages, though. They're they're low. I mean, they're 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 higher amongst um, Hispanics this year than they were in 2016. They're slightly higher amongst, uh, I think, black men than they were, but still like, I think, under 10 percent or something like that. Right. Like it's a low number. And there are those individuals. Right. And we can talk about what's going on there. And I certainly don't want to, like, get into you know, calling them whatever uh, Biden called them, right? Not not politically black or something oh, right. like that, oh, right? Yeah, that um, but like, I mean, the reality is there's always been groups like that within the Republican Party. There's the log cabin Republicans are gay Republicans, yeah. right? Who will say that they are not defined just by being gay. They're also defined by, you know, their other perspectives, right? You have Dave Rubin is a log cabin Republican at this point, essentially. Right. Um, so like, those groups exist. And the, I think the most generous read is, right, they would say they prioritize certain parts of their identity over other parts of their identity when they vote. Um, and you can debate with them whether that makes sense, right, whether that's a reasonable way to do it. But that's that that was that, that I would say is their justification for doing so. OK, OK, so I, I yeah, man, I, I've been wrapping up for the past 20 minutes, but you're just <laughs> Ah, I just want to keep asking. There's there's just so many things because like I don't want to like the the I don't want it to be like, oh here's here's the counter for this, you know, because I'm a Canadian. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> as you've mentioned. Yeah, as I've mentioned a number of times. <laughs> Cause you know, but but I, <laughs> I also I do want to hear different perspectives and I and like you just have so many. <laughs> As an ethics, I do have a lot of. As an ethics professor, I feel like you've really uh, teased him out. So anyway, but I think that yeah, uh, closing thoughts is what I'm trying to say. Not how it looks from over okay. here, but well, sure, I think yeah. You, I well, I think you definitely believe what you believe, and you know why. So that's that's what. Um, you make it sound worse and worse every time no, you say it. No, um, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm I, saying that's I, a good thing. I lose thing. my philosopher card if you say that I believe things. No, I know. Oh, I know. Right, 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 it right. sounds it sounds like good to normie ears oh, to a philosopher right, right. ears. I'm sorry. Like, You're oh, exploring God, you things. You keep things. on exploring. Is that better? <laughs> it's okay. better. Um, no, I mean, normie look, I do ears. have beliefs. Pardon like, me. I, I, I won't play the full. So- I won't play the full Socrates okay. here, right? Like, I think I have justified beliefs, and I think those beliefs are justified. And in motivating actions uh, like, you know, our central conversation around voting, like I do still think that like it's you you have one party right now that is actively trying to circumvent the democratic process. It couldn't be more obvious to me that like that democratic and process is important and needs to be, 
you know, engaged and actively by participants in our society. Interestingly, it's possible that the Republicans' constant attacks on the democratic system will undercut their own self-interests because there's some evidence that suggests that when people don't trust a the system, they're less likely to participate right. in it. And so they might end up suppressing their own Republican voter turnout. Um, I don't know how much that's actually going to matter in the end, but I mean, it didn't matter in this election. They got a bunch of turnout, it seems like, despite all of the talk of fraud and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, I guess my closing thoughts are I'm not super optimistic after the election. It didn't go far enough towards correcting the various problems that we face. And so I think we're going to continue to grind on in an unproductive way. And the Republicans did not get the message that they needed to break out of the Southern strategy death spiral that I think they're caught in. Okay. And so I think we will continue to see exacerbation, polarization, radicalization, and conflict. Cool. And we will and we will muddle on the best we can. Okay. You know, and hopefully we can we can have eventually the COVID will end. Yeah. And hopefully and eventually, you know, some things will get back to a little bit more normal. But like I'm not I'm not super happy about democracy in America. At the moment. Okay. Oh my goodness. It's so funny because yeah, I like to try to end on a more positive note. <laughs> but my show doesn't work that but way. But it's sorry. the truth. It's where it's where it's where a lot of people are at on both sides, actually, probably. Sure. So that's where we're for, you, different, for reasons. different reasons. <laughs> but a lot of people are probably feeling what you're describing. So, yay, we found common sure. ground for both sides. Sort of. Uh, okay, well, I'm just calling. I'm calling it and calling it. Okay, thank you for Aaron. I don't even think I officially introduced you, man. That's probably true. I, I like. I was like, oh, we're talking about your PhD. You have to do a job. I will do an intro anyway, and I will note that. But hey, Aaron Rabinowitz of the. Um, do you want to plug your podcast? Sure. Uh, you can find more of my dark musings over on <laughs> Embrace the Void podcast um, and the slightly more lighthearted Philosophers in Space podcast where we talk about science fiction and philosophy oh, and only one. a little bit of politics. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's uh, it's a fun one. I don't, it's weird which people don't know about which things. But yes, um, they have different flavors. So try them both and maybe one will work better for okay. you. <laughs> I think I will. Okay. You need to send me the information for that second podcast that sounds a little bit lighter and nicer. Sure, okay. I can. Okay, thanks. Just don't listen to the parable of the talent episodes that we just did. Start with something oh, else. Oh, okay. Okay, well, which one should I start with? Just number one? Uh, if you wanted to go back to the beginning, you certainly could. Um, our Children of Time series, if you've read. I mean, find something that's like a thing that you really enjoy. Because okay. we've covered a lot of I do now, like So, like, find fiction, a thing. But, okay. Do you have Star yeah. Trek and Star yeah, Wars? Yeah, find a thing you really like. Start with that episode. Okay. If you like it, try other episodes. Okay. That's our fault. Okay, okay. Oh, you know, so just like, you know, have, having something that you enjoy and going with that. Okay. Well, I'm glad yep. that you have yep. some, yep. some something that you do enjoy and that you go with those things in that podcast. That sounds like you have a little light in your life there. I do. Oh, man, I learned so much about how it is to be a philosopher and it sounds really intense. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to... Okay, I'm going to stop. Thank you, Aaron, for being... On my podcast, this was very informative. No problem. It's been fun.